I mean, we just received so many orders globally, you know, like, you know, Europe, Australia, Asia, you know, like it just, it, it was just like this instant way to just become a global brand. What's up? Welcome to Masters of Crowdfunding. You got Mark here today. So I just finished up this interview with Ken. It was super interesting. Um, typically on this podcast, you know, we're talking to people that are just starting out, right? They had an idea, they use Kickstarter or Indiegogo to uh, launch their product and their business. But uh, Ken's been doing this for a long time. So uh, Canoe is the name of his company, uh, started back in 2010. Um, so over a decade of experience. And it's very interesting for him to share his story of not only starting the company, but the evolution of the company um, and why they ultimately went with Kickstarter after a decade, again, of be being in business, having a really strong retail business, distribution business, and, um, and why he wished that he did this earlier. So there's a lot to learn, a lot to take away from his story and, and all the tactics that he shares as well. He's also just a really cool guy. So he also told me one last thing. This is a, his first video interview that he's ever done. So... Uh, please welcome Ken, and uh, I hope you enjoy this episode of Masters of Crowdfunding. All right, we're live. Ken, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Mark. Of course. So, you know, we're just meeting right before this. I'm already asking you questions about how this thing started, and you're getting excited. I'm telling you, hold on. We're, we're about to press record. I want to hear you actually tell this for, for the audience. So I'd love to ask that question again. Uh, just take us back to how, how Kenny started. It was back in 2010, correct? Yeah. So it's uh, it's interesting because, you know, the company has actually been around since 2002. You know, I was uh, literally about to have my first kid. My wife was pregnant. And while most people are, you know, buckling down and not taking risks, you know, I'm you know, uh, I left uh, my previous company. I was a co-founder of Joby, which was the makers of the Grillapod, which ended up being like number one selling tripod in the world. And it's still pretty relevant out in the photo kind of content creator space. And um, um, and the founder, Joe Ben, is actually uh, doing Joby Aviation. He's like this Elon Musk guy that got like the first FAA approved uh, flying aircraft uh, that's kind of like short hauls from like um, like uh, San Jose to like say San Francisco or something like that. But uh, yeah, it was just uh, you know incredible to work for this guy for a long time. And I know this interview is about me, but you know I just wanted to give you that kind of prehistory because it was just literally the best business school to take like an invention in someone's mind, you know and go to China, make it, and then create a brand. <laughs> and and my team, you know, that I have currently is been with me since, you know, since the Joby days, you know, I was able to get all the best engineers. But yeah, in 2010, I started Canoe. And, uh, you know, it. my name's Ken, and the joke is that it's Ken and you, but I wasn't narcissistic and trying to find me. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, a name, a uh, company name with my name in it. I was literally just looking for like a uh, four letter domain. Uh, and literally was going through AAB.com, AAC.com, and the list sort went through thousands of potential domains. And I came across K's and it had my name in it. And, uh, you know, I think that was just kind of uh, the universe just bestowing a, a really nice name for the company. Hold on, hold on. Did that did that cost like a normal amount, a four letter domain back in two thousand ten? Or did you do you spend a lot on that? Yeah, you know, I, I'm an open book. I'll answer all your questions, you know, um, and I'll let you know if anything's too private. But uh yeah, it, at that time in two thousand ten, uh it, it was just owned by some company squatting on it, you know, it was just a company that was squatting on domains and they wanted five thousand dollars for it and at the time you know it's total bootstrap startup about to have a kid you know totally did it just you know uh, and and just to let you know uh i funded the canoe as a bootstrap startup myself so n never had to fundraise or or uh get investors so um you know has its pros that i don't have a boss but also has the cons because i'm constantly got to worry about all the things <laughs> yeah but um, but yeah, it uh, uh, it, they wanted five thousand dollars for the domain, and I called the guy up 
and as some sales guy and I was just like, yeah, I'm bootstrap startup starting my company. Like, you know, is there any way you can cut me a deal? And, uh, the guy's like, you know what? Call me at the end of the quarter, called him at the end, like literally on the last day of the quarter. And he gave me half off. So I got, I got a four lauder domain with my name for 2,500 bucks. <laughs> and, and honestly, honestly, you know, uh, you know, if, if I can just give some kind of, you know, unsolicited advice for anyone looking to start a company. I think trying to find a domain first is like a good way to figure out a company name moving forward just because you, know, you can like brainstorm and be like, oh yeah, you know, Mark is an awesome LLC, you know, and, uh, you know, that domain may be taken, you know? <laughs> right, right. Now I got to look if there's a Marku out there, see if I can get it for 2,500 bucks just to have it. And that sounds awesome. Yeah. Mark you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. So this, so now 2010, you get the domain. Um, what was like the original like vision for this company? Like what were you, like what were the original products or like what were you trying to do, do with it back then? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's really interesting, right? Because, you know, Joby was an accessory for point and shoot cameras, right? Which was high tech back then, right? I don't, I don't know how old you are, but, uh, <laughs> you know, you out of point and shoot, you look young, but, uh, you know, ever since the smartphone came out, especially the iPhone, the first iPhone, right? And, you know, it, it did so much more than just be a phone and, you know, had a camera and, and everything. And, you know, for me, I was an avid snowboarder and I still am. And so I was just like trying to figure out how to make, create a lifestyle business, right? And I was like, huh, I wonder if I could create a company and write off my snowboarding, right? All sounds good in theory, Mark. But let's just say making a company on a seasonal sport, so niche, not a good idea for growing a business. So uh, so Canoe's first product was actually an iPhone leash. That, it, it was pretty cool. It was like, uh, had a Kevlar core in it and a loop. And I don't know if you remember like the old iPods and original iPhones had like a 30 pin connector. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a big one and actually had like little hooks you could lock to. Yeah. So that was our first product that we released. And we launched that in uh, December of 2000, uh, 2010. Yeah, started in c the company in 2000, early 2010 and launched it in late 2010. And it did great. It, it, a lot of ski, you know, places carried it. But the universe being cruel sometimes, right, and testing you. Uh, Apple changed their dock from the 30 pin to the lightning connector the next year. So <laughs> made our product obsolete in one year. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so, well, before you go on, actually, I'm really curious. So are, is your background in product development? How did you, how did you even come up with that first product? Yeah. So, um, you know, my, my background mainly was computers and I was in uh, enterprise software sales here in San Francisco. Um, but like I had mentioned, I was able to be the first employee of Joby and get to work under this insanely intelligent human Joe Ben Bevert, you know, who's doing these flying cars right now. Uh, you know, he, I basically was able to take an idea that he came up with Stanford Engineering School and, you know, take go to China for the first time, you know, develop relationships with all the factories and, you know, and and they're still our partners today, right? So this is like 2010. And, uh, uh, you know, just do, do a gazillion trade shows and open up all the biggest retailers globally and just kind of create a, you know, a, a product from nothing to like a global brand. And so, the, you know, literally the best business school for me, you know, because I was literally doing the two hardest things that you can do in a company, making the products and selling the products. <laughs> and so... So it, it wasn't that huge of a leap for me to start my own company, but I really did want to focus on smartphones. And, and that's what Canoe is today. You know, we, uh, we feel like we're a really boutique-y, sexy design, very minimal, very functional uh, company. And so I think the, the, premise, the, the reason why we're talking today, Mark, is because uh, we uh, partnered with LaunchBoom, right? And, you know, being a decade old company we did crowdfunding for the first time <laughs> and it was and it's amazing we should have done that from the beginning you know like we should have done it way sooner but i think given uh when i started canoe um you know and sorry i'm a little long-winded here but 
you know, our first product was this product called Highline. It was an iPhone leash for skiing. So you wouldn't drop your phone off the chairlift. And then uh, in 2013, uh, we launched the Airframe, which is was like the first portable vent mount that you see. Uh, I mean, you get into any Uber and you'll see some ripoff copy of, of our product that we own the patent on. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's awesome, though, that you have the patent on that. But they... Right. But they changed it a little bit in order to be able to to sell it, or is it actually infringing on your patent in some cases? You think? Yeah, you know, uh, I wish I could Bill and Ted's, you know, telephone back in time and talk to myself then, you know. But I think uh, there's two different types of IP for design. Like there's a design patent and a utility patent, and the utility patents are, you know, more complex and and harder to to get because uh, it has to be novel. I mean, they all have to be novel, but design pants are really easy and it's just mainly ornamental, you know, like Google, uh, sorry, Samsung and Apple had like a massive lawsuit just based off of the shape of an iPhone being a, a rectangle with rounded corners, right? So it's really easy to get around design patents, but uh, yeah, I, I, I wish I had my patent prosecutor now. Uh, and a prosecutor, it's confusing because it sounds like somebody that litigates, but it's actually someone who files patents. And um, and my person who I have now is amazing. My buddy Jeff who's a neighbor of mine here. <laughs> but, um, yeah, let's just say the first, you get what you pay for, you know, like the first patent that we designed was very easily work, work around the bull. That's not even a word. But, uh, well, yeah, we launched Airframe in 2013 and it just, took off like a rocket ship, like went bonkers and got into like every major retailer in the world, like instantly. <laughs> so that was, that was, that was, that was great. And so, you know, the company used to be a lot bigger back then, you know, and, uh, uh, it was a different environment, you know, e-commerce wasn't, it was just kind of taking off. And so our main business model was distribution and retailers like brick and mortar. You know, and so it was great. It, it 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 made the brand, and it's funny, Mark. We've sold over five million car mounts, right, globally. But a lot of people don't know the brand because you know they, at some point, you've probably owned a canoe airframe car mount in your car, but it uh, just sits in the car and nobody sees it. <laughs> right, 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 right. So the brand's not known. Exactly, and so you know we've been. Work, we were working on this project called Holy Grail. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm just keep going on and on and on here without you even asking. But, oh, okay. but, you know, I, I, I think getting to the point of why we decided to do crowdfunding, uh, you know, ten as a 10 year old company is probably uh, the question at heart. What I'm like really curious about in the from the story that you just told. So, you know, we, we were talking before we, we press record that it is pretty rare on this podcast for for me to interview someone that has a company that's existed now for over a decade and then chooses to go on crowdfunding. So we definitely are going to get there for sure. But I'm I'm also just really curious to hear about like the evolution, maybe from like broad strokes of the company to then getting to where you are now. You were saying that, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know at the beginning it was mostly around like retail and distribution partners. That was how uh, you initially got. A lot of your sales and grew the company and then it sounded like you were going i'm really curious like how e-commerce came into to play or i don't want to i don't want to lead you here where or wherever you want to take it i'm really curious what were those you know the evolution of canoe um to then where you got where you are now currently uh, mainly from like how you were actually selling the product okay well i mean in 2013, when we launched Airframe, you know, it, it was funny because we actually did try to do Kickstarter. Oh, really? Yeah. So, so we did uh, attempt to apply for a Kickstarter, and the, again, the universe just throwing all kinds of, you know, blocks against you. Um, Kickstarter was kind of at this, uh, inf you know, like apex, you know, or, or a point where they. A lot of people were thinking it was an e-commerce store and people were complaining that they weren't getting their, like a lot of these creators weren't able to get it made and ship product, right? Right. So uh, Kickstarter uh, at that time in 2013, when we applied, just created a category, uh, just had a blanket statement saying like, we no longer accept automotive products, right? And 
I didn't yeah. Know. And so we, uh, we, we applied and then we also, uh, like, you know, uh, appealed it, you know, but it was just like this very blank, e even though like, cause our product was not a lot of people were using their phones for GPS in the car in 2013 at that time. Right. And so we were kind of ahead of the curve <clears throat> and having a holder that attached to the vent of the car. But, you know, I think just it being so fresh with Kickstarter, um, they decided to just not approve the project, but ended up being a blessing in disguise, you know? And, and that's one thing I love about just entrepreneurialism and just, you just got to try, you know, no matter how many times you get kicked down, you know, you really just got to like drag yourself up and like, and, and become a ninja and try to figure it out. And so there was um, a company called Locatron at the time that did their own DIY crowdfund and they released their uh, source code on the internet and they killed it. They did like million dollars, you know, look like a Kickstarter, but it was all their own, right? I had no idea. That's yeah, it's, it's ancient history, Mark. Yeah, you're going to take that out. <laughs> yeah. And so in 2013, um, we got denied by Kickstarter, right? And we're just like, oh, man, that's, you know, you know, Kickstarter was really prevalent then, right? And so we did try to do that, right? And so what happened is, is we actually, I, I found a, uh, a coder. I, I got the source code, found the coder, and we created our own DIY, you know, crowdfund page for airframe, which is the car, portable car mount, vent mount. And we literally launched it, right? And we just like sent an email out to friends and family and, you know, uh, had, had some media contacts. And the next thing you know, we wake up in the morning and our phone is like literally like dinging every second with a new, e like a new order confirmation. You know, it, it was like a slot machine. It was amazing. But, uh, Basically, it just it just went viral, like you know, all, you know, and it, it just got a crazy amount of coverage, and you know, it just got kept getting picked up, and it, so it was, it was it was literally like the best success story you could have possibly had with the launch, you know, and um, and it turns out one of my employees, you know, we live in San Francisco, right? So we got tons of friends that are working for you know these big tech companies, right? Like Apple, Google, and um, and my employee's really good friend actually worked at Apple looking for new products, right? And, and at that time, Apple was, retail was a totally different landscape. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if you remember, Mark, but when you would go into an Apple store before, it was very, like, fun, right? Like, I'm not saying it's not fun now, but, like, they, they, they curated a lot of third-party products, right? And you'd go in and you spend tons of time and do a discovery and you're like, oh, wow, this is so cool. I didn't even know this existed, right? And, and so, um, so it was good timing, you know, back then to start the company because within a week of launching, we got an email from Apple saying that they want to do a 50-store test. And, and the and small company, like, you know, like the biggest retailer in the world is asking for your product, right? Huh. And so, um, so basically, we did the fifty sort test, right? And within a week, it sold out instantly. And we got an email from the buyer saying, "Your test blew it out of the water. We want to roll out to every single store globally in the world, right?" And we we didn't even have the tooling capacity for that, so we're like pushing all our partners in China, making more molds for the product, right? And so, you know, that, that, that we just went into the stratosphere from that, you know, just having Apple. And then from there, you know, it's just a trickle effect down, right? Then you get Best Buy, then you get Target, and you get T-Mobile and AT&T, and then you get all these bigger retailers globally that are similar, right? Um, and so anyways, I'm being long winded, but that, that, that's kind of was the start of canoe, but you know, it really put this, put us into this distribution and retail kind of channel and e-commerce was kind of like a, a secondary, you know, priority for us, which was a mistake in hindsight. Can you talk about that? I'd, I'd love to hear about that. So as it, as it changed over to e-commerce, like direct to consumer being one of the main channels. For you. Yeah, you know, f f for us, just because, you know, we, we, we were just crushing it at retail, right? And like literally the sell through, like we we're like Apple's number one selling car accessory in the category for like two years, you know? And um, 
it, uh, you know, of course we had Amazon and we had our own web store, but we weren't really focusing on like, just like the optimization of ads through meta or, you know, I mean, it was Facebook at the time, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. you know, or, or using really Google AdWords, you know, we were just so busy. The company was so busy just, you know, making product and develop and trying to develop new products. Right. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, we, we didn't really focus on e-commerce just because our retail business was so massive and, you know, and, and in hindsight, right, like I feel like that's every 10 years ago, right? Like any brand would love to be an Apple, Best Buy, Target, right? And the e-commerce, you know, is just kind of where you start, right? And there's a lot of successful brands that have started on Amazon and now in the retail, like Anchor, for example, right? And so, uh, you know, Anchor started as an online brand, but now they're just this global brand and, you know, and they actually do things on Kickstarter too, even as a huge company. So why was it a mistake though? Like what would you say was a mistake in hindsight? It was a mistake because, you know, we just needed to hire somebody to, 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 to focus on the, and grow, you know, building out and growing the e-commerce for us. But for us, we just, you know, maybe we're, we're too old school. You know what I'm saying? Got it. Got it. So it's something that you wish that you started doing in parallel with the retail efforts like earlier. Absolutely. And, 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 and I mean, and honestly, like I, I wish we had just done Kickstarter and, you know, done like a, f have the success of like fellow, um, you know, coffee, you know, that Jake's actually a friend of mine and, you know, they've grown and then like, you know, there's other companies like that as well that have just kind of grew their company just doing Kickstarter for every single one of their products. So now that's a good good segue into, you know, with, with Stance Plus, that this is now the first Kickstarter. I mean, you tried to do one a long time ago, but you finally got through. <laughs> this is the first Kickstarter. So why did you come back um, to Kickstarter for this this product? And I would say the follow-up question to, be, to that would be, do you feel like it was successful? Yeah, I mean, just straight up, honestly, like, Kickstarter was an amazing success and, you know, got actually got to work with uh, the Kickstarter team and they were wonderful and, you know, uh, use an incredible video company that my buddy Mike has in Reno uh, that, that killed it on the video, you know. Video is awesome. I was, I was watching it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, they're amazing. Um, uh, guys out of Reno 88 studio, but um, yeah, it, it, it was just time, you know, like, the, the the whole, you know, I, I don't want to be like doom and gloom here because we love our retail partners and we're still in a lot of global retailers. Um, you know, I think COVID really affected, the, you know, the brick and mortar space, you know, and, and Amazon's obviously just a behemoth in the space. And, you know, nobody's, I shouldn't say nobody, but there's less people going into a store, you know, just parking car, going into a massive store searching for your one thing that you're looking for, you know, when you could just order it on Amazon, you know? So, um, so, so we did focus on our Amazon business and our Amazon business is really healthy and, 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 you know, they're, they've been great partners to us, but, um, you know, we've always wanted to do a Kickstarter, you know, and just a little bit of unsolicited advice for any entrepreneurs, you know, that, that, that does see, see success. Um, don't let, the retailer tell you who you are because, you know, we created this car mount, right? And we just wanted to just make gadgets, like just in, in any way to help humans, you know? And, you know, we just ended up becoming a car mount brand because it's like a different buyer for the car mount category, right? So we had to keep making the next car mount and the next car mount and the next car mount, right? And so we ended up becoming like this car mount brand, which is great, you know, but it really didn't... uh help our roadmap, right? Because we were always trying to figure out what was the latest and greatest car mounts, you know? And, you know, right now we're on our fourth generation airframe, you know, and uh, I wish I had one actually, but it's, you know, I, I would say Canoe products are, pro you know, it's not the cheapest, right? But, you know, my engineer has a master's in engineering from Stanford, right? And so this, you know, David Yao, and he's, was also the engineer at Joby, right? So he, he just is really amazing engineer and like, you know, like our products, you know, are sexy and functional. That's all I can say. You know, they're not this big clunky Frankenstein looking thing, you know, like we really focus on the aesthetics, but really the functionality 
And we really focus on making it out of really high quality materials because I feel like a lot of consumers these days are just buying the cheapest thing on Amazon, right? And we call it the Shenzhen special. <laughs> and, 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 peop- and, it, and it breaks within like a month or two or six months if you're lucky, right? And it just becomes landfill, you know? And then people are spending another $10 and another $10, you know? And so the thing for us is like, if you buy canoe, you're gonna have a better experience right from the start. You're not gonna, you know, make your car look ugly, you know? And um, and it's just gonna last. And if it doesn't, we have world-class customer service and we always take care of our customers, you know? So that's just my tip to consumers out there. Don't buy junk. That's what yeah. I like it. Save some more, more stuff from the landfill. I um, I'm your, curious. Like, oh, what was that? Yeah, to answer your question, the reason why we did Kickstarter, you know, it's something that we've always wanted to do since the inception of the company. But because we already had, you know, a, a distribution channel and retailers in place, we would just launch a new product and then they would take it, right? So it was it was, it was really kind of a a nice golden path for us, right? But you also run into getting kind of stuck in that kind of channel, which is why I said that we wish we focused kind of more on our e-commerce, right? And so that's what we, so, so, so when we came up with Stance Plus, which is this guy right here, it's just a little MagSafe, uh, it's all aluminum and it's got 10 functions um, and it just sticks to the back of the phone and just kind of like becomes like a stand, you know, and and it becomes like an airplane holder, selfie stick, has two different car mounts, it's got four powerful magnets here. And so when we create, we started working on this project, the project name was Holy Grail, right? Because we just wanted just to create the most, you know, amazing gadgets that it w- that is out on the market right now. And, and not to toot our own horn, but we, you know, we believe it is the best gadget on the market right now, right? Especially if you're, um, uh, you know, have, have smartphones and you like photography and you like to travel. <laughs> right. And so, so, so we really saw this as a great opportunity to do Kickstarter for the first time. Yeah. Which makes sense. And I, I guess the follow up question to that would be like, why is it more successful? You know, like that's, I think that's where, especially with like, I guess any brand, but if you're an existing, um, brand that has establish retail channels, for example, as in your case, like why is it that doing your own Kickstarter is so like appealing, you know, especially if you uh, have a successful one, like what does that actually give to your company? Is it, is it like you're making more money? You know, you have more control over different things. You know, like those type of things. I'm, I'm like really curious. Yeah. Um, yeah, why why Kickstarter was so successful for you or why you would continue to do it? Yeah, I, I mean, honestly, we just really wanted to get Canoe out there as a brand, you know, and and it's, in, it's insane. Like we have, as a global brand, even though we're in retail stores, right? Like if you go to France, we're like the brand for like electronic, like for mobile accessories there, you know? And, 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 it, and it's amazing, you know, such a small country, you know, um, can do that for us. But, uh, you know, it's funny cause when you make car mounts, Mark, right. People buy it, leave it in their car and nobody sees it except the driver and your passengers. Right. Right. <laughs> and so with, with, with stance really being this like unbelievable, you know, travel tool, creators tool, like we're getting just a ton of inbound requests from all these social media content creators, you know, who are just really focused on, travel, you know, photography, lifestyle, um, it, we, we, we wouldn't have been able to get that exposure to these influencers without Kickstarter. And, you know, it, it, we, we ended up killing our goal by like 2000%. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, and, and we were the number one Kickstarter, you know, in the category, you know, while we were going through the campaign. You know, so there was just a lot of great accolades that, that, you know, happened. Um, but no, I mean, we just received so many orders globally, you know, like, you know, Europe, Australia, Asia, you know, like it just, it, it was just like this instant 
way to just become a global brand, you know? And and it, and it's funny now. People are like, oh yeah, I do have your car mount. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And now they recognize it. They're like, oh, I do know who you are. Yeah, <laughs> that's really interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah, I I'm curious now. You know, going forward, how do you think that Kickstarter will play into your overall business strategy? Um, like, is this something that you're going to continue to do with new products or certain types of products? Yeah, how does it play in here? One thousand percent. Every product that we launch from here on out will be launched on Kickstarter because. You know, we already have a a base now <laughs> of of people who bought the product or followed the project or whatever, and so n the next product that we launch, we'll just already have that built in, and then we'll grow it from there. And you know, that's how how Fellow Coffee started, right? They started with their first Kickstarter, and now they have an insane number of products, and it's like the best tea kettle on the market, you know, or co coffee brewer. You know, and uh, and and they're doing really well. They're in they're in like retail stores now. So you know, I think it's just, I I think doing crowdfunding and kickstarters is a great way to just seed your company, you know, and and grow it from there. So to answer your question, we will definitely be doing Kickstarter again. Yeah, is that something that you feel like like multiple Kickstarters a year, or have you even thought that that far out? Yeah, uh, right now we are working on Stance Plus Plus. I don't know if that's the official name yet, but um, you know, w once we get that dialed in to canoe level standards, uh, we'll definitely be launching that on Kickstarter. So, ho ho hoping that comes out this year. Awesome. Well, we're looking forward to to seeing that come out. Well, Ken, I really really appreciate you uh, joining the podcast, sharing your knowledge. Again, it's it's really cool to talk to someone that's been doing this for over a decade. And then coming to Kickstarter and having that be added into their business strategy. So I learned a lot, not only about you, but the business. And also, I think a lot of people can take away a lot of the advice that you shared. So I appreciate it. Okay, great. Well, thanks for uh, inviting me. And you know, honestly, this is the first video interview I've ever done. I'm kind of private, but really, yeah. And oh, man, that's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> honor. That's great. Yeah, I mean, like, well, I, it, it, I, I don't need to be, you know famous or anything like that but like launch boom was so integral in the success for for us kickstarter newbies you know and when you yeah. reached out to do an interview i was just like I, i'd love to awesome well i'm honestly honored to have you for your first video interview did great so i appreciate it really thanks ken cool nice to meet you mark thanks for having me of course all right cheers <laughs>